Setting up a bioactive enclosure for your bearded dragon, it can be such a fun and rewarding experience. And to be honest, when I finally switched my bearded dragon over to bioactive, it was the best decision I ever made. Now, although very exciting, it can be also very overwhelming, especially for some with bearded dragons as being their actual first bioactive enclosure that they're doing. So today we're going to be going over step by step how to set up a bioactive enclosure where at the end I'll be giving a little bit of some common mistakes I've noticed for beginners when they're starting out. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into setting up a bioactive enclosure for a bearded dragon. Now just to give you guys a little background, you know, I've had my bioactive enclosure, my bearded dragon going on for about three or four years now and has done amazingly. He's gone through so many transitions, you know, from a 20 gallon to a 40 to a 75 gallon to then that was on tile that didn't, I didn't switch to um, a bioactive enclosure, which then got switched again to the six foot by two foot by two foot, a P cage that's bioactive, then another switch when we moved to now what's been going on for a two year enclosure. It's definitely come a long way and I've learned a lot, you know, tweaking every little thing, you know, every small mistake or something that I noticed that's just off getting it to where I think is the perfect uh, bioactive setup for my beardy. So starting out, let's talk about substrates. Now, if you don't live in the USA, and you're probably in the UK, Europe, anywhere like that, you probably are able to get the Arcadia product, the Beardy Soil, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. That's awesome. I can't get that in America. And honestly, even if I could, um, this is a six foot, by, six foot by two foot enclosure. That's gonna cost me a pretty penny to fill with those little packets of soil that they uh, produce. And that also includes a lot of people with the minimum size being a four foot by two foot. That's a lot of ground to cover with a pretty good amount of depth. You want at least six to eight inches, especially if you have a female that, of course, with them egg laying, it is always good instead of you know, providing a hide box, your entire ecosystem or you know floor is the hide box for them. I meant lay box, not hide box. <laughs> So instead, we are going to be going with a topsoil sand mix. Now, what this mix really is, is just any organic topsoil. Uh, personally, I choose Scott's. I like the consistency of it and the color. I've noticed other soils are more of a weird brown, like chocolatey color, where this one is a nice soil look to it. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I just, it's just what I prefer, Scott's topsoil. Um, then if we're talking about play sand, I just go for the children's play sand. They come in like 50 pound bags, they're ginormous, they're heavy, but 50 pounds lasts you a long time. Now there's a lot of ratio mixtures being thrown around, you know, 50-50, 60-40, 80-20, a lot of people just kind of, some people just scrap the soil by themselves and just do the dirt. Uh, I personally went with an 80% topsoil and 20% play sand mix. Um, that is not an exact science, don't ask me like, oh, how many bags or, you know, how much top toil does that equivalent to? I just, it's a lot of dirt and not that much sand is really the uh, gist of it. Now, how many bags you're going to be needing is really dependent on the size of your setup and really how much soil or, you know, substrate that you want in there. Um, honestly, these bags are wicked cheap. I think the soil is like two bucks and the sand's like four or five bucks. So I would just opt to get at least three bags of soil and then one bag of the play sand. And the most important thing other than the substrate is of course going to be the cleanup crew. I mean, it's not a bioactive substrate without it. Uh, when choosing your cleanup crew, you're going to want something that is it has a little bit more of air. It's something that doesn't need to solely survive on humidity just because of the fact that the humidity levels in a beard or drag enclosure aren't going to be too high. So with that being said, I honestly only keep dwarf purple isopods in there. I found that they like it a little bit more drier than I offer them a nice humidity retreat just in case that they choose to do so. Um, other than that, I use a lot of what we commonly use as feeders. So things like the um, Morio and mealworm beetles, I commonly use for the um, enclosure as a cleanup crew. Uh, doobie roaches I find to be excellent. It's re the really nice thing I love about doobie roaches is one, just because of the heat in there, they'll actually colonize and you'll have a small colony of doobie roaches. So your bitter dragon pretty much has unlimited snacks at that point, but also the fact that if there's any veggies left over for the bearded dragon doesn't want, they're not going to dry up or get gross. The um, dewy roaches actually eat the remaining lettuce, or not lettuce, but the uh, salad that you choose to put in there. The only thing other than those items I use is also some earthworms, just to aerate the soil to help with the plant growth a little bit, although as you guys have noticed in the enclosure, uh, the plants have slowly died off one by one to just um, one plant at this point. And then some final things you're going to be wanting is some leaf litter to make sure that your cleaning crew has some place to retreat during the day to keep a little bit uh, hidden and that helps with a little bit of humidity. I'll stay between that layer of the soil and the leaf litter. Um, some plants to help get that ecosystem cycle going. Uh, we'll go get into a little bit of the plants later. Of course, I'm probably not the best due to the fact that you know, some have not made it and uh, the one plant they do have been doing uh, so well. Um, lastly, an LED light to help those plants grow. Now, as far as the leaf 
leaf litter goes, there is quite a few companies that do just make the leaf litter and package them to make it convenient. If you live stuff in like um, more of a city area where there's not many like parks or areas that you can go to collect the leaf litter that isn't uh, free of any uh, pollution or things like that. However, if you live more in a, you know, outdoor area like myself, um, I just go to my local conservation area and pick up the leaf litter from there. Then as far as the plants go, you can get that at really any nursery. Uh, I always prefer to go to local nurseries just because, you know, helping out small business and things like that. However, you know, you can also find them at any um, Walmart or Home Depot, most of the plants that um, you want to get. And then an LED light can be found at any um, hydro shop or even most pet stores would carry like the aquarium LEDs, which is the one I'm personally using. All right, we've talked about all the materials you're going to be needing. Now, let's head over to Rex's enclosure while I'll be explaining step by step the process I did to make the enclosure to what it looks like now. Alrighty, then here's the setup. There's Rex right over there. Um, so just to give a little basic, uh, you know, how I set this thing up, of course I did the soil, and as you can see, it's a nice uh, mix of topsoil and then just some placing to give it a little more texture. Um, I keep it pretty dry over all the way onto that side, so that's a lot more hard packed and dried down, whereas this side, you can see it's a little more moist. It helps with the um, cleanup crew and things like that, helping keep them a little humidity up and then also, of course, I have to water it for this plant right here. Um, so really, all in all, all you want to do is just get your substrate in there, mix it up. Uh, I usually let it sit for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, just let the dust settle and everything to settle down. Then you can go ahead and start setting everything up. Um, the branches here, I just got from either a pet like the Mopani wood, I got from um, a pet store, but most of these branches here and um, over here, I just uh, forged from outside and put in the enclosure. Um, other than that, I think that's, you know, it's, it pretty, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You know, I got my leaf litter right here to make sure that the cleanup crew is, um, has a place to, uh, go and, you know, lay low while the bearded dragon is, uh, nice and awake. Uh, of course I got my plant right there. It's, um, not doing too well, but you know, it's, it's hanging in there. I have the LED lights stripped up, uh, with zip ties, and then I just have this, um, full background. So I think other than that, um, we'll just head back to the uh, chair where I'll talk a little bit of you guys about some of the uh, common mistakes that I've been noticing in the uh, when people are setting up a bioactive enclosure. All right, let's talk about some common mistakes. Now, the biggest common mistake that I see every single time when I see someone first setting up a bearded dragon enclosure is they use succulents. Hey, I'm wearing a hat now. So, succulents, now I get it. On paper, it sounds like a good idea. You know, they're desert plants, so they don't need to be watered that often, which is awesome because you don't really want to water the soil for the bearded dragon enclosure too often. And you know, they're really pretty to look at plant. You know, all sounds good. Listen, when you try to execute it, it just does not work. I made the mistake, man. I put succulents all in my bearded dragon's enclosure. I think I spent anywhere from, I don't know, 20 to 30 bucks on like six different succulent plants. Um, I think they died within four hours of me planting them and putting the dragon in. Now, unfortunately, the plants are just too sensitive to take any of the, you know, the wrath that bearded dragons have with, you know, the grace of them moving around. They're gonna squash them, try to climb on top of them, try to dig them up. It just, succulents do not work for this kind of setup. Another common mistake that can actually be pretty detrimental is when people are choosing their soil, they don't actually get the organic top soil. They'll get something like miracle Grow or some sort of potting soil substitute. Now, when you're picking out the dirt to give for the breeder dragon for the bio to set up, it is very important that you do get an all-natural, all-organic top soil mix, not a potting soil and nothing like miracle Grow that has all sorts of additives and fertilizers mixed into it. Now, the big issue I see when people are starting these things up is that they do not water the soil. like really at all or at least not enough so you know you spend all this time and money on getting these nice plants in there that look great but then you kind of lose track don't water the soil or afraid it's going to raise the humidity and those plants end up dying now it is very important to actually you know water the soil this is going to help not only the plants live longer but also help with the cleanup crew um establish such as those you know those more arid uh, isopods and things like things like that able to have a moist retreat to go into um really if you're having too big of a humidity issue you might want to opt to getting some more ventilation on whatever enclosure you choose uh personally for me i actually drilled more holes in the side of my enclosures through my ap um setup just so it would allow more ventilation humidity to um leave faster and then wrapping up to the final and pretty much the biggest mistake I see people do when they dive into making their first uh, Beard Dragon bioactive enclosure is plan ahead. 
a lot of people, and including myself when I first started, kind of just, you know, wrap a basic enclosure or bioactive substrate build and kind of, you know, put stuff wherever and that's pretty much it. Then three months later, you see some flaws here and there and then you have to switch it up and switch it up a little more, then switch it up a little more. And, you know, next thing you know, you've been switching plants in and out, you know, moving stuff around. Next thing, now you want a background so you have to take it all out. <laughs> I would really just take a day before you really execute this enclosure and just picture in your head, you know, what do you want this build to look like? Do you want that custom background? How many plants do you want? Do you know when those plants get bigger, are they all gonna kind of crowd each other? You know, just things like that to kind of get a general idea on what you want this, really envision what the build's gonna look like before you actually go ahead and execute it. All right, guys, and there you have it. How to set up a bioactive enclosure for your bearded dragon. Uh, sorry if the video is a little dark. My light ring burn out, burnt out on the last video, and it's going to take probably four or five weeks for me to get a new one due to stuff happening, so you're going to have to deal with uh, dimly lit uh, videos from here on then. But if you like the video, please feel free to give us a thumbs up. If there's another bioactive enclosure build you want me to go over, you know, that'd be like red-eyed tree frogs, crested geckos, uh, things like that, leave me a comment in the comment section. I'll do a video on it. I kind of like talking about the bioactive setups for these guys. Um, other than that, if you want to see some more of my animals or breeding products, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at DBCB Exotics. And then also, of course, we do have that podcast, The Herp Hour. We just did a one-on-one -on -one podcast with me and John. We talked a little bit about pet tubers and then just really get interactive with the chats. We do those on Thursdays and then we do have an upcoming event on Saturday uh, that's going to be with Uncharted Wilds. I'm looking forward to it guys. So uh, that pretty much takes the cake. I don't know what else to say so uh, have a great day. <laughs>